what I'd like to talk about is a produced water from unconventional. Now that we solved all the legacy issue, we can turn our attention to produced water. And I want to talk about origin of the produced water characteristics, what are the potential impacts, what are the management options, and I'm going to close off with a few uh, thoughts on future challenges and opportunities uh, in addressing and, and produced water issue. Everybody knows this, so I'm not going to spend any time on this uh, slide except to remind you that you frack the water. And I do insert K in the fracking business. I'm sorry, I started like that 10 years ago, and so I can't change, you know, although the original wording was without a K. So it was fracking without K. So you, you inject the fracturing fluid, you tear up the rock, you shove in the propent to keep the fractures open, then you have to take the fluid out, and that is your produced water. Now, in the frac fluid composition, there's a lot of discussions there, and the EPA website contains hundreds of chemicals that have been ever used in hydraulic fracturing operation anywhere ever. And so there's like hundreds of chemicals. Nobody's right mind is going to put all these chemicals in the frac fluid. And so you can see that the chemicals range from acids, you know, biocides, cross-linkers, and all of these chemicals have some purpose in the frac business, and there's a lot of them, but you're not gonna put all of these chemicals into one job. And the reality is that early on, we try to uh, put this in perspective by saying, okay, less than a half a percent of the total volume or mass of, of stuff injected in the well is chemicals, but considering that, you know, we're injecting five million gallons of water, 2,000 tons of sand, you know, half a percent is still about 50 tons. That's a lot of chemicals, so that didn't serve the right purpose. But nowadays, you know, in Pennsylvania at least, where we exclusively do a slick water fracturing, they basically introduce three chemicals. Okay, fracture reducer is not single chemical, but it's a FR300, FR400, mostly polyacrylamide. Uh, but, you know, there's one chemical for fraction reduction, one antimicrobial agent, and scale inhibitor, and that's it. So the, the, the uh, and in that case, the additives are less than 0.1%. So that is much better than half a percent that we used to use in the past. Now, after you're done fracking the well, you have to release the pressure, let the water come back out to open a pathway for gas to start migrating to the surface. And that is a, so called the flow back because, and it's a, just operational definition, it really doesn't matter. It's the first couple of weeks when you have an active crew flowing back the water and managing that water before you put a well in production, and then suddenly we call it a produced water. It's the same thing, so I'm gonna talk about it as a produced water in general. So we typically in Pennsylvania get anywhere between 10 and 40%. This, is, this was a vertical well, so it doesn't matter. 10 to 40%, and the flow rate starts off at 6,000 barrels a day and then quickly levels off to you know, 10 barrels a day or 20 barrels, 50 barrels a day. And actually here, you have to choke the well to not take the sand out. So the reality is that the 10 to 40% of the water comes back out during the flowback period, and the rest comes back out during the operation as a produced water. So the question is, why only 10 to 40%? Well, the shale formation, when you frack it, there is a lot of water that's being held in the shale formation by capillary forces, because we're talking about hairline fractures, so the capillary forces are holding a lot of water there. Plus, Marcellus is almost bone dry. You know, it's very undersaturated. And it's a lot of water imbibes into the shale and stays there. And then it comes back out over time with the gas production. So <clears throat> the question, first question that people were asking, is this fracking fluid going to contaminate our groundwater? Is it going to reach the groundwater and so forth? And the DOE did a fantastic job in the Greene County where they were monitoring six well, wells that are being uh, drilled in the Greene County. They had a few uh, uh, conventional upper uh, Devonian wells in the, in the Bradford Formation and they put a couple of monitoring wells and they were monitoring this site for a very long time. And basic conclusion that they came up with is that, you know, there is the fracture growth during the hydraulic fracturing stopped more than 5,000 feet below the drinking water wells. And there was no evidence of any 
uh, upward migration of gas or fluids from this hydraulically fractured Marcello shale well that's going to go up and start contaminating everything above it. <clears throat> now, the producers here were quickly discovering that they don't know what to do with this water, but so the less of it comes back out, the better off we are. And so then they discovered if you shut in the well, not by intention, by an accident, they ran out of, they didn't have the pipes ready to go, so they shut in this well for about 13 days or so, and they got less than 10% of the water to come back out, just because the water imbibes more and more into the shale formation and stays there. And that's a good thing for them because the less water that comes back out, the less they have to deal with. But the reality is that, for example, in this case, we had uh, two wells that were fracked with a tap water. Believe it, you know, they used to frack with a tap water. And, you know, the two wells nearby actually mimic each other in terms of the quantity of salts or TDS, total dissolved solids, start off at about 20,000 and kind of increases in levels to about 100. In this case, this was the well that was shut in for 13 days, but it was fracked with the produced water reused in the formation. So, of course, the salinity comes out much higher because your frac fluid was 50,000 TDS. So your produced water is going to be at least that much and it's going to grow from there. And the reality is that there's a lot of uh, um, data that people have looked at at various formations, how the, the water that comes produced water that comes out initially is a signature, has a signature of the frac fluid and then later on has a signature of the produced water and you basically have, you know, reduction in the hydroflac, in the frac fluid and increase in the formation water and this is the paper from Kondash and Science of Total Environment to show you that here are the different formations and their best estimate as to the salinity of the water and the volume produced. And you can see that the Marcellus is pretty dry. It's a very little volume produced. And one of the producers early on told me if, if the Marcellus were anything like uh, Permian, you know, with all that water, we wouldn't be developing it as, as fast because we wouldn't know what to do with the water. So it was just the luck or the draw that Marcellus doesn't have much formation water and we don't have to deal with it. Now, what's in the produced water? Yeah, you know, you can typically look at this anions, you know, total dissolved solids, you know, up to 340,000, and then radium and uranium radioactive active, uh, components. And uh, clearly, when you see the barium that can be 2,000 milligrams per liter and calcium, magnesium, fairly high concentrations, the first thought that we had was that, yeah, maybe if this industry is systematically polluting the surface water, we ought to see some barium, you know, coming up in the surface water analysis. And so, because there are spills that have been recorded and Sue already talked about it, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about spills. They do happen, but these are spills that are in the DEP, web, uh, PA DEP website. And they include two gallons here, 20 gallons there. Even the spills on the line well pad are recorded on the spill database. And so uh, if you look at the one mid-sized ZNP company that in 2012 moved 68 million barrels of water and the total spill, they had a 66 spills that were total number of barrel equivalents that were spilled was 1,500. That's 0.002% of water that they moved around spilled. I would think that's a pretty decent record in terms of what happens with the water that's being moved around. And so we look, you know, Sue and I have been looking at it for three years because we wanted to become famous and, and show irrefutable evidence and say, aha, we got you. And so unfortunately, in all our good conscience, we couldn't make a determination that, you know, the barium and the bromide concentration, all these other contaminants are systematically on the rise in surface waters in Pennsylvania. Of course, you know, once we get closer to this period where we're monitoring closer and, you know, this industry came to town, that's one of the good things about this industry in Pennsylvania because environmental issues came to the forefront. People are much more cognizant, much more uh, aware and are monitoring and, and looking at these issues. So that's good for the environmental engineering department. Um, and so, in, and they're starting to monitor discharges, you know, permitted uh, discharges from unconventional water treatment, salt water springs and so forth. And that's where you have these higher levels. But if you look at 
uh, uh, bury him. You can go back to 1965 and, and today in 2010, the differences are not observable. So we can't really say there is any systematic evidence yet. The other question comes a lot is the organics. Aha, uh -huh. inorganics, not a problem. What about the organics? Well, uh, if you look at this, this is a very nice paper it came out in 2017 where they looked at the 40 compounds divided into semi and the volatile, semi-volatile and non-volatile compounds that are associated with produced waters. And these uh, group of researchers took all these compounds and said, okay, let's see what happens if we take a a uh, well field under development, we were drilling about 60 wells per year and assuming that 70% of that water is reused for fracking and that 30% is directly discharged into a local creek, you know, during low flow conditions. What's going to happen? So they took this uh, risk-based approach to say how much of a risk is that going to pose for the ecosystem in the aqueous environment? And it turns out out of these 40 compounds that were initially identified, there is only about nine of them that exceed this risk quotient above one. And this risk quotient is calculated by dividing the maximum concentration of these contaminant in the, uh, um, I'm sorry, in the river, maximum concentration predicted in the river based on the dilution ratio with a probable no, no effect concentration, meaning that these were based on the studies that anybody has ever done with this compound and what is the lowest concentration that exerted any kind of impact on Daphnia or fathead minnow or any of these aquatic species. And so you can see that there's only a couple of compounds that have a fairly high risk, you know, three, four compounds that have a fairly high risk and the other ones are uh, uh, not on the radar. The reason why I'm bringing this up is that, uh, to me, we shouldn't be focusing and trying to identify everything that's exactly in that stream because we could spend the next 20 years doing that as the analytical equipment gets better and we can trace level, detect trace levels. We can do that. It's not a problem. We should take this risk-based approach to see what happens if this water ends up this produced water ends up in this scenario or that scenario, how much of an impact is it gonna make before we make a decision to investigate specific compounds? Now, <clears throat> what do we do with the produced water? Of course, you know, you already heard in the video that 90% of the produced water is going to a disposal wells. We tried the discharge to publicly owned treatment works in Pennsylvania for a short period of time and then quickly figured out that that's not a right thing to do. We have some centralized waste treatment facilities in Pennsylvania that are by and large converted. The, the, most of them were from, un, from the conventional wells and very small flows and so forth, but now most of them are being converted to a recycling plants. And then the other one is this treatment for reuse or surface discharge, you know, is the other option. This is what I already mentioned that uh, is, is a brilliant strategy that came out of Pennsylvania in support of the oil and gas industry. So disposal wells in Pennsylvania, very few of those available in Pennsylvania, no commercial capacity to speak of. And, you know, they will probably play a limited role because most of the formations that are suitable for disposal are already taken for gas storage. That the gas storage makes more money than the disposal well, so it's unlikely they're going to be converting these formation into a storage, uh, a disposal wells. And the other thing is that people have start looking at these conventional depleted reservoirs. And I'm nervous about it. I don't think it's a good idea simply because if you look at this graph, you know, from a classical graph, you know, that looks at how far from the horizontal formation, how far the fractures extend to prove that in most cases in the Marcellus Shale, we're more than 5,000 feet below the bottom of the groundwater. And that was the point of this figure. But the other point that I wanna make is that this conventional well are sometimes at two, 3,000 feet. The other thing is that the fractures can, you know, extend 2,000 feet if they keep fracking uh, uh, overboard. And so, to me, using the conventional uh, uh, depleted wells for disposal is a very risky proposition because, like you heard, we have 200,000 
conventional wells, we don't even know where they are. And so the chances of connecting with one of these well wells are pretty high. So treatment for reuse and fracking operation, that's a great idea, reduces liability and the volume of water. And so we looked at what are the roughly the cost of the treatment for a variety of options. When you take it to a class two disposal well, then you do a little bit of a treatment in the field for reuse, or maybe you do a little extensive treatment for precipitation for the removal or norm, or you do the offsite. So there are technologies that are already in play that can be used and they cost money, anywhere from three bucks a three dollars a barrel to maybe seven dollars a barrel. This is that based on the techno-economic analysis, it's got no market conditions built into these costs. And so this is how we switched from 97, where most of it was uh, uh, basically going through a conventional treatment. In 2007, we started a little bit with the POTWs, but right now 90% is being reused. A little bit goes to Ohio for disposal, and there is a little bit of advanced treatment processes like mechanical vapor recompression and compression to remove the water and recover clean water out of it. Now, the problem that I see, and, and I sit in an academic institution that can afford to think five, 10 years down the road, and the problem that I see is that every well field eventually becomes a net water producer. Your water reuse for fracking only works as long as you have another well to frack. Once your your, your drilling schedule is out of whack for whatever reason, either the, barrel, the cost of gas goes down or you're done fracking, your ability to reuse the water is diminished more and more. And these are projections, you know, in Pennsylvania that it's going to keep just going into the, uh, the number, the volume of produced water that needs to be handled is going to keep increasing. And these are projections that Shell made in 2011 for a specific well field that at some point the amount of water produced is going to be greater than what's being able to reuse for fracking and then somebody's going to have to pay the piper and figure out what to do with this water. Of course, disposal wells are a big alternative in, in Texas, but as we've heard, they're under pressure. The capacity of disposal wells is getting to the limit and so they're being taken by producers and we're going to have to figure out what to do with this water. And so we said we can do the treatment and the favorite response from industry is like, okay, we can do advanced treatment, recover the salt and do crystallization and get sodium chloride out, get 90% removal. I said, great. But the question is, what are you going to do with all that salt? And back at the envelope calculations say that you know, let's say we have 80,000 wells in Pennsylvania and we get 80% salt recovery it's for free. It doesn't cost anything. We're going to be producing 8 million tons of sodium chloride in Pennsylvania. You can't think that all of that is going to be using for de-icing the roads because the entire U.S. of A uses maybe 12 to 15 million tons of salt, including Colorado, Wyoming. And so you're not going to ship salt and beside the current salt producers, are not going to play dead and, you know, turn over and say, okay, Go ahead. So we need to figure out what are we going to do with this water and think about it as a resource rather than a liability. The other issue that's coming back high on my radar screen is this norm in Pennsylvania because we have the most radiogenic formation that we're fracking into. Right now, there is very little norm being generated comparatively. And most of that goes into the landfills and basically each landfill has an annual limit that it can accommodate and as long as you dilute it with the garbage to stay below 25 picocuries per gram, you're good. And so, but the problem is that right now we, we had a, when I did this calculations, it was seven and a half thousand wells, so total radioactivity 22 curies. When I divide all of that by the volume of solid waste generated in Pennsylvania, I end up, you know, below five picocuries. But if I make a projections, what is the amount of radioactivity is going to come back out? Once we're hit over 35,000 wells in Pennsylvania, there's going to be so much norm coming back out that I can't possibly dilute it with all the garbage that's being produced in Pennsylvania. And somebody's going to have to ship it to Michigan or Utah and pay 400 bucks a ton for disposal. <clears throat> so to summarize, um, we've seen a rapid development of this industry and like any other industrial activity where people are involved, you know, accidents can happen. 
but there is no evidence for widespread groundwater contamination by the fracturing fluid. There's no widespread evidence for sustained impact on surface water quality. We have very little disposal options in Pennsylvania. Those wells in Ohio are 300 miles away from Tioga County, so it's pretty expensive to truck the water there. And so the flowback water reuse is a great alternative for now works perfectly in Pennsylvania, but it has a limited lifetime at some point. It's not gonna be feasible. And at that time, we need to be looking and developing industries that are gonna utilize some of the resources that are available in this produced water, whether it's a sodium chloride, calcium chloride for fertilizer, or whether it's a lithium and some other components that are valuable. And I think uh, maybe the time is now to think about these opportunities in the future. So with that, I'm gonna thank you for your attention and be happy to answer questions. No questions, okay.